But um, our next speaker that's coming on is someone I'm excited. Poor, poor guy is out in LA. It's, it's um, Alberto Candiani. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. He's, this guy is amazing. He's got one of the greenest meals. Fourth, fourth generation. He, there's just re, every year or so, these guys are in, sort of innovating amazing things. And just recently, they, they, in, they made their latest technology, which is a, a fully biodegradable stretch denim, which is, I'm sure he's going to talk about. Um, unbelievable. I'm always excited to hear these guys, and especially Alberto. Thank you so much for your time, Alberto. Please take it away. Hi, Moa. How are you? All good. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Hi, Transformers. Um, good to see you. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I prepared an interesting presentation, uh, which is a little bit about the industry and it is a bit about the volumes. And I think that would be interesting nowadays, especially after this pandemic, because things would probably be reconfigured. Um, so I, I'd like to start with an interesting, interesting video and, uh, and then we keep going with the presentation. What the hell is this? Tastes like Gatorade. Is that that Brondo stuff? They're watering crops with a sports drink? Brondo the Thirst Mutilator had come to replace water virtually everywhere. Water, the basic component of all life, had been deemed a threat to Brondo's profit margin. The solution came during the budget crisis of 2330 when the Brondo Corporation simply bought the FDA and the FCC, enabling them to say, do, and sell anything they wanted. Joe didn't know any of this, but he did see a problem that he might actually be able to solve. With his options running out, Joe took a bold step. He would not get out of the way. This time, he would lead. For the last time, I'm pretty sure what's killing the crops is this Brondo stuff. The Brondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. So wait a minute. What you're saying is that you want us to put water on the crops? Yes. Water. Like out the toilet? Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be out of the toilet, but, but yeah, that's the idea. But Brondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. OK, look. The plants aren't growing, so I'm pretty sure that the Brondo's not working. Now, I'm no botanist, but I do know that if you put water on plants, they grow. Oh, well, I've never seen no plants grow out of no toilet. Hey, that's good. You sure you ain't the smartest guy in the world? Yeah. So <laughs> okay, look, you, you want to solve this problem. I want to get my pardon, so why don't we just try it, okay? And not worry about what plants crave. Brondo's got what plants crave. Yeah, it's got electrolytes. What are electrolytes? Do you even know? It's what they use to make Brondo. Yeah, but why do they use them to make Brondo? Because Brondo's got electrolytes. After several hours, Joe finally gave up on logic and reason and simply told the cabinet that he could talk to plants and that they wanted water. He made believers out of everyone. Joe didn't know it, but the beloved electrolytes were salts that had been building up in the topsoil over the decades. Okay, so this is actually a very interesting uh, movie, uh, Idiocracy, which I recommend to watch, especially during this pandemic. Could be, could be quite entertaining and visionary at the same time. But um, we'll get there in a second. Let's talk uh, about our industry. And uh, yeah, our industry, uh, the denim guys, the denim lovers, they truly love the past. They love history. They love vintage. They love um, heritage. And at the same time, our industry loves the future. And uh, yeah, um, the future is a little bit of a different story because the future is about innovation. The problem that we've been facing in the past few years is that the industry claimed to be in love with innovation and future and uh, responsibility towards the planet. But in effect, um, they didn't do much to change um, 
And it's not easy to be in love with the future and with innovation if you don't love change. Um, in fact, um, you know, transformers uh, easier um, to study a little bit this phenomenon because we all know that most of the innovation uh, we see out there, well, it's, you know, it's made of pretty relevant stuff uh, that doesn't really change things and doesn't really require change to be done. It requires good marketing in order to be packaged and served. So it looks good. It looks revolutionary. It looks cool. But in fact, the change requires more technicality and more experience. So again, uh, this is something which transformers really care about. And I'm very, very glad to participate and, um, support transformers as a foundation as well. Um, and then we have the present. And if you look at the present, this is a very interesting present. Uh, this is yesterday um, or the day before yesterday, Earth Day against Earth Day a year ago. And as you can tell, things have changed. And um, if you focus on uh, where I'm from, so Northern Italy, you can look at that very nasty cloud. And uh, right now I would like to tell you about our green, my companies, and we are located in the nature reserve as a matter of fact. And the nature reserve is what has forced us to become greener and greener and to invest in smarter technologies just because um, they made so many restrictions that in a way they guided uh, in, uh, through this process. But the nature reserve is pretty much located where that um, nasty cloud is and the nasty cloud is there because the Alps are there. I love the Alps, my favorite mountains. Unfortunately, they're blocking a little bit the air as you can tell, but um, it's quite clear um, that um, that makes us very much aware of the problem. Uh, Northern Italy can be compared to certain areas of China. We're always looking at China when we talk about pollution, but we, we, we should be aware that in Europe, we're not that far. So look at 2019 and look at 2020. Now, let's say that um, this is just a natural pandemic that, you know, the virus is not man-made or, you know, I don't want to get into any type of conspiracy theory here. Of course, the humans have interfered with nature in order to let this pandemic happen. Uh, but if you look at the difference, the difference is quite, quite impressive. Now, Going back to the video we just watched, the, 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 the movie clip, um, that was a post-atomic uh, type of future. We can even envision it as a post-pandemic uh, type of future. And um, obviously it's, it's satirical and ironical and I do not expect um, that future to happen anytime soon. But um, like the Brando stuff, that type of aggressive greenwashing marketing, well, that's generating confusion. It is happening, it's everywhere. It's not just in the denim industry, um, it, is, it is everywhere. The problem is that this confusion doesn't really affect the industry. It does affect the end consumer. And uh, a good friend of mine doesn't call it the end consumer no more. It, it's the citizen, we're, we're citizens before we're consuming. We are consuming citizens sometimes, but we make choices. And, um, and choices have to be relevant. So when there's so much confusion and, and, and this loud marketing makes so much noise, then the end consumer, the citizen, I should say, is like, whatever. And the whatever effect is the worst because the whatever leads to ignorance. And here, especially in Transformers, we're trying to, you know, to share education and to enforce education. So. We have to be more technically prepared and, um, and we have to change this industry because denim has a big, big responsibility towards the planet. Let me talk to you for a second about the company and about the market. Um, so again, Candiani was founded in 1938 by my great grandfather, Luigi, who started as a tiny, tiny workwear uh, facility. Uh, by the way, I loved uh, what Alberto De Conti just said about workwear and this neo-fusion with Danny, which certainly will happen, and I totally agree. Um, so what's interesting is that the market back then, um, let's say in the 50s, 
um, especially because of workwear, well, the demand was much higher than the offer, especially in Italy, northern Italy, which after World War II was like a very much growing, um, growing economy. So again, the demand was exceeding the offer by far because of the need. And then my grandfather, my, my grandfather was the one who scaled the business up and made it vertical. So not just a weaving, but a spinning, a dyeing, a weaving, a finishing, you know, vertical denim mill from, from the fiber to, to the fabric. And again, um, demand was exceeding the offer because society was changing and, you know, denim was representing a pretty, a pretty cool item back then. And it was something that wasn't just workwear no more. It became, it became everything. It became your daily, uh, pair of thing. My father, Gianluigi, he was the one changing our denim. Um, he was the one, you know, um, perfectioning stretch denim, uh, going for a more feminine market, um, creating the premium industry, uh, the premium fabrics, not the premium industry, um, but the premium industry really appreciated our fabrics back in the 90s, especially because our stretch qualities were superior. Uh, they were just nicer, basically, and the performance were uh, were good against the competition. And again, the market became more of a global market. So if you look at my grandfather, my great grandfather, they were playing a very domestic game and the market was about Italy. Um, with my dad, everything has changed and the, and the market became global. And uh, right now we export 92% of what we make. And then you have me, um, Alberto, uh, the sustainable guy, uh, sustainable denim, uh, whatever that means today. But uh, yeah, we have a problem here because demand no longer exceeds the offer. Uh, and that is because of a very simple reason. It's not because of sustainability. It's not because of innovation. Those two things actually go together and they make, uh, they should make the, the, the demand uh, stronger and the offer more interesting. But we are facing a very interesting problem, which I call the flood. And um, yeah, um, if you, I, I'm just sticking to my numbers and to my company for a second. Okay, so we, our capacity pre-COVID-19 uh, was 22 million meters uh, a year. So we can produce um, uh, roughly, um, we can produce 22 million meters um, in one year. And with those 22 millions, um, they make more or less uh, 16 million pair of jeans. So we have a tiny, tiny share of the global market. Um, and uh, our price, um, the average of our price is 5.26 euros per meter. The average of our cost per meter is 470 euros. If you look at the market, well, the market today is around 2.60 euros per meter for fabrics which can be somehow compared to what we do. Of course, that, you know, um, yeah, less innovation, uh, a little less performance. They're probably uglier because, you know, we make pretty good um, looking denim, but comparable to the end consumer, to the guy who doesn't really know. We're talking about the more basic uh, pair of jeans. As a matter of fact, we don't really own any share of the basic, basic market, but yeah, that's where the market stands today at 260 euros per meter. And uh, I promise, and as you can See, at 260, at Candiani in Italy, we do not even, co even cover the cost. So why is that price so low? I mean, it's, it's a global industry. It is a global industry. Everything uh, became more challenging, more competitive, but volumes made the biggest difference because our, um, our beloved denim and its um, economy is so much related to volumes. It's always been, it used to be a commodity type of fabric. It still is sometimes, but um, it is very much volume, uh, volumes related. So I'd like to define the fashion industry as the first industry that demolished the archaic con conception of market intended as supply and demand. And, um, and I'm saying this because in 2018, the total amount of garments produced on the planet uh, reached uh, over, um, um, sorry, oh, under 20 billion units, which is more than the double against 2008. So 
Uh, that's not even the most scary uh, fact. To me, what's more uh, scary is that over 10% of this global production goes landfill before even reaching the stores. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, apparel industry in general. Now, if we look at denim, well, we're looking at 250 million pair of jeans or denim item that they go landfill of or burn every year, every year. So there is a flood. And again, the offer is obviously exceeding the demand. And many, many big brands are including these numbers in their, uh, in their uh, economical sheet. It's like, okay, well, we just produce this much and if we can't sell it, it's just gonna go landfill or burn. And this is very scary to me because in the last, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, 30 more denim mills appeared on the planet. So we are still making more. I mean, we're making um, something which is not so needed and we still believe uh, it's a market, plenty of opportunities, which deserves more production. And I'm very much skeptical in this sense. So, um, well, it, in the near future, more meals are expected to appear on the planet and, and the global denim capacity will, uh, will actually will go over 3 billion linear meters um, in the next five to 10 years. And I'm just talking about vertical meals. So these, these 3 billions are made by meals like mine. I'm not talking about con uh, converters or uh, not vertically integrated meals. So the, the numbers are much, much wider. And, um, and again, they're not needed. They're not needed and no one is really going out of business. Now, I don't know if things are going to change after the pandemic, but in the last 10 years, I still see like Danny mushrooms popping up and, and, and we're all there. We're still there and we try to make more and make more and make more. Because of course, we stick to the, capit to the capitalistic assumption of continuous growth. And uh, I mean, I'm a businessman myself. I mean, you're trying to, to grow and to, and to make money, but I'm just concerned we're not doing this in the right direction. Um, so everything has always been based on, on a historical assumption, um, which I define a misconception, that humanity will consume more and more than him forever. And that is something which I'm questioning. Um, I mean, at least for denim as we know it. I mean, denim is changing, it will change. And, and, the, and meals should change in order to make a new type uh, of denim, not the old school commodity kind of denim, which we know it consumes so much chemicals and water, which is just a pretty, pretty large damage for, for the planet itself. And again, uh, denim as a mass volume based industrial like commodity, as I just said, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really make sense no more. There's no, there's no need for, for those quantities. And, um, and again, volumes have always been related to the, to the opportunities which uh, globalization has offered. Um, I say the land of the cheap because, you know, many people went to um, cheaper countries to make their denim. Um, and most of them didn't really go to those countries just because they want those countries to grow or they care about the local population or community. Uh, they go there because it's cheaper. And if it's cheaper, you can make more. And if you can make more, eventually you can make more margins. Again, I'm not here to talk shit about nobody. And um, actually I have to say that there are new meals and new companies that they really care about the local communities wherever they are, especially in the last 10 years, the mindset has changed. But historically speaking, nobody really did give a shit. They were just going for higher margins, higher volumes, make more, make it cheaper. And then something I did talk about um, earlier, it's, it's the wow effect. So this, this is also unsustainable. This is something which has to change. This is something which has to be kept under control because change requires transparency, honesty, and truth. Uh, we can't flood consumers, citizens with storytelling, which doesn't relate to any type of relevant innovation. And again, this applies to the denim industry quite a lot, but it does apply to many other industries as well. So the only solution uh, to 
let's say, to compress the volumes and to keep the business alive, because I know that right now many friends of mine are like, oh, this guy is crazy. This guy is trying to, to do less and, 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 and to sell less and, and to make it more expensive, which means you sell even less. That's not really the model we are approaching at Candiani. Um, we are more into circular models and circular revolution. Uh, we believe there is a way to, uh, to compress and to reduce volumes eventually and to keep up uh, with the business, with competitivity as well. It starts with, uh, with uh, reduce. And re reducing is something tough, guys. Um, I've been through this before. Um, roughly 10 years ago, after the big mass, uh, the economical crisis, I was forced uh, to reduce my business, my production, my capacity. Uh, we didn't lay off people. We, 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 you know, we took advantage of the social safety nets and we did it smoothly, but we went from 620 workers, six, I'm sorry, to over 650 workers to 580 workers in five years, and we went from 30 million meters to 22 million meters, but still we managed to reconfigure the mill in a way that we could still be competitive. And um, also we didn't have to compromise our quality, our service, actually our innovation and R&D uh, got even better. So we took it as a challenge and we made it feasible. And I know to reduce doesn't really make sense to those they study economics in the past 30 years, but it's something which we should seriously consider if we can make it happen. Uh, reuse, reuse is a very simple concept. It's very much based uh, on efficiency. So efficiency is the, go is the grandmother of sustainability. You want to be efficient if you want to be sustainable and, and vice versa. There's no point of creating waste uh, if you make um, if, if you create waste in your intermediate processes, then you just want to make sure you want to reuse that waste. It's efficiency. That's it. And it's something which we should keep in mind, um, especially when we talk about large textiles operations like denim mills. Um, for instance, cotton fibers or uh, some of the cotton leftovers during the spinning. I mean, there's a huge quantity which you can reuse in the well, by and respin it, for instance, in, in the same yarns uh, or, or in many other different ways. But again, it is all related to, to efficiency purposes. Uh, then, of course, recycle. Uh, recycle, it's, recycle is a duty, guys. Re recycle is no longer a trend or a thing. Recycle is duty. Um, we should all recycle as much as we can. Um, it is very much connected to the reuse principle. So anything which could be recycled internally during the process has to be recycled. You just want to recycle it. There's no point of creating waste. And then of course, we have to recycle as much as we can of, what's, um, of, of what it is post-industrial, but also what is post-consumer. The, the point is that with the post-consumer recycle stuff, we have to come up with smart solutions. And I think it's a long, long way to go. Things are changing, things are happening right now. But um, again, um, before we, re I mean, we should recycle is a crazy amount of garments and, 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 and leftovers and dead stocks, obviously. But then we should start to make a little less so we don't feed this other system before it becomes corrupted. And in order to do so, of course, we have to rethink pretty much everything, the industry. We have to renew. And for renew, I mean that sometimes, you know, our industry, the textile industry, is the old, oldest industry on earth. And... Uh, we base very much everything on previous experiences and sometimes we just don't do things because they use, I mean, people use, used to do that in that way and blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, we need to renew some of the old concepts and some of the old concepts are still good. So we have to look into those concepts, understand what can be improved and not to revolutionize them, but to renew them in order to make them more modern and, and more sustainable. And then regenerate, and regenerate is probably the most important um, aspect. Um, regenerate your waste, regenerate your products, um, regenerate um, uh, your water, regenerate everything you can because regeneration is the only uh, serious path to circular uh, models. And if you 
if you're able to regenerate or to make regenerative whatever you make or whatever you create in the intermediate processes, uh, like in our case, we're, as you mentioned earlier, uh, we, we, we are about to launch actually 100% um, um, uh, biodegradable stretch denim. It's, it's a specific technology, pat patented technology we call Coriva. And that comes uh, with a specific circular model, which is related to regenerative agriculture. Now, this is a whole different conversation. And again, we will launch Coriva later on in 2020. And this particular regenerative agriculture uh, circular model is, 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 is quite complicated. And I'm not going to talk about it right now. But it's the only way uh, to become uh, proactive towards the environment. So the industry, till this very moment, has struggled to lower the impact. At Candiani, in many different ways, we proved that we can neutralize our impact, especially where we are located in, inside the nature reserve. I believe in the future, we can really make a positive impact on the environment. And this is all related to our ability uh, and capability of regenerating everything we, we do. So to, to finish, to wrap this up, uh, we believe that less is more, obviously, but less has to be better. And you can make less and make it better, and people will eventually want more of that. But it's a long way to go. It's a long way to go. And um, it's all based on, you know, um, what was the Master Yoda sentence? I forgot. You have to unlearn what you learn very much in a global industry like ours that's not going to be easy uh, thank you so much for your time now, what time is it right now you're in la right it's 3 38 a.m i'm in los angeles because i i joined my family we my wife and the kids were here for family yeah. reasons and uh, the good thing about a nighttime zoom sessions like this is that the kids are in bed and Quiet, yeah. and the neighbors are not abusing the internet because lately it's it's been crazy the connection it's really one, where everyone's streaming like madness. Um, we've got some questions. You've been you've been very 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 popular. Let's just go 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 through them. First one is I love your I love I love being. Oh, someone's just sort of commenting how love they love your presentations. That's very nice. Um, they're saying your presentation makes it clear there's so many reasons for the whole industry and our students should implement the donut model. Very good. Citizen Soda like Starship Troopers. Very funny. Um, Claire Ford's asked a question about the difference between biodegradable and de de and like degradable stretch denim. How is the how is the like sort of sort of how is the like sort of the recovery? I don't know if you're going to answer that because you said you weren't going to. Talk yeah, I, no, no, I, I can't answer that. It's I, I mean I try to be um, I try to simplify. So degradation is part of biodegradability. Right. Okay. Something has to degrade in the environment in a certain amount of time in a certain condition in order to become biodegradable and eventually compostable. Okay, so those are different steps which everybody has to keep in mind is degradation, eco-compatibility, mm. biodegradability, um, disintegration and non-ecotoxicity and then compostability. It, everything is very complicated, but people are getting more and more used to this. And, uh, and the difference is, is that, for instance, we are using a very smart uh, ingredient also from, from Royka. It's called, they call it B550. We call it um, Resolve. It is, it's, it's a different type of polymer. It's a different elastomer that it's not biodegradable, but it degrades in the environment and it is eco-compatible. So that is a first step. And of course, we wanted to do more and we are aiming for biodegradability and even more. So we came up with Coriva. But again, that's going to come a little bit later. Yeah, no worries. Another question. Do you think mills will still open up after COVID? Do you think there's a shift between smaller mills, vertical mills, lots of mills? We keep on talking about growth question mindset. Do we need more? Understand Do you need to make more money? Would you put lots, 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 lots of questions from, from Marlene? Would you, would you prefer to talk about the collective growth and sustainability community where we are? I don't know if you want to touch on that. Sure, sure, sure. So we, we need more quality. If you buy more quality stuff, then you generally need less of that. And because more quality equals longevity and durability. But then I understand that our industry is about fashion, so you want more and more and more. But then more has to be feasible somehow. Right now it's not. And um, the growth of, of um, sustainability, I mean, it, it's something incredibly good. But um, 
it, it's it's great for us for the industry it's i'm now i know i'm talking to students mostly which is great yeah. because those guys represent a generation that should be more technically prepared than our generation that they're like the green washers in a way yeah. all right i mean sustainability is can be even more relevant if it becomes more honest and transparent and that's in in your hands guys more more than ours yeah it's so, up to these students yeah and uh, some of them absolutely. will be in, in like positions of power in a few years time they'll become buyers and designers so it's really important that these these students who are learning now really implement some of these things and, and ask these important questions going how good is it how good is it oh, I, you know all the, all the right questions but yeah let's see the rest questions i think we're just saying even more well done six even people more said amazing like presentation oh, thank you anyway. thank you very much but e even more important is to make sustainability and sustainable innovation cool to the end consumer or to the citizen yeah. because right now they don't they still do not care much because it's still boring and another very difficult thing is how to translate all those technicalities into something appealing and engaging i think we're yeah. getting there and again i'm glad we're talking to students more and more because i i'm sure they will help to find solutions well i think you know you guys are one of the more more like transparent mills you know the fact that Whenever we order any fabrics, I see fabrics from you. There's a lovely fact sheet explaining everything about it, and it's so lovely. And I remember the students at Ravensbourne were so happy to receive some of the fabric that you guys sponsored. But not only that, you gave so much information as well. That was amazing. And obviously, there's so many innovations you guys are doing that you can't talk about. But I know you're experimenting with hemp as well, which is exciting. So, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah there's a lot. Yeah. Well, going back to regenerative agriculture, we know we can eventually grow hemp and um, by the mill. Mm -hmm. um, Again, it's a very long way to go, very long way to go, and things are very complicated because then it's not easy to make a fiber out of the amp that we may grow outside the mill yeah. to make like a, you know, our own local production. But of course, we're looking into that and into other regenerative agricultural models. Um, thank you so much. I have to cut it there. I'm being sent, being warning messages, but you did amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, please go, please go to sleep. Um, uh, and thank you so stay much. Stay connected some more. <laughs> stay connected. Watch out. Okay.